Good morning, ladies. I should say good morning, y'all, like I do on Sunday mornings. Good morning, y'all. <laughs> so we're so glad that each of you are here today. Hope you enjoyed our praise and worship. It's so wonderful to have a live praise band, wasn't it? I mean, it just makes all the difference in the world. So, so thank you, praise band. Um, but anyhow, I would like to introduce Leslie. I, um, Leo and I had gone to a pastor's conference at Word of Life in Scroon Lake, New York. And um, one of the very, it was the first one they had, first one we went to, the very first couple we met almost as soon as we got there were Leslie and Russ. And uh, we just, you know, our hearts just knit together and our souls knit together and just had that common interest in uh, the Word of God. And as she and I talked, we talked about women's ministry and teaching the Word of God to women. And that's a passion of hers as well as mine. And so um, I thought she would be perfect for today. And so um, with no further ado, we'd love to have you welcome Leslie Melville. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> I remember very well the first time we met you. Yeah, it was a, it was a, a conference of several pastors and their wives, and, and my husband is very outgoing, and, and his goal was always to, every meal, sit with new people, because he wanted to meet new people. And uh, then we met Martha and Leo, and... I was like, every meal, it's like, can we sit with Martha and Leo? <laughs> we really seemed to click there. Well, good morning. I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, this is a beautiful day. The weather, I mean, what's up with the weather? <laughs> it's like, it's cold, then it's hot, then it's cold, then it's hot. Um, but whatever it is, it's beautiful because God sends us what he sends us, right? And, and we just, we'll take it. And I thank you for inviting me here for this, um, your Women of the Word conference this year. I'm very honored, I'm very humbled, and honestly, I'm scared to death. So bear with me. <laughs> uh, just a little tiny background is, uh, I was born, raised, married, and still live in the same town, a little tiny town, a little mill town of Corinth, halfway between Saratoga Springs and Lake George. And uh, I married my high school sweetheart, 39 years this September, so there's nothing like super and exciting and exotic about, <laughs> about my past, okay? But I do look back at, at the years of Russ and I together, and, and I cannot miss God's hand that he had on us. You could not find two more different people on the planet if you tried. We had nothing in common. Yet back in 1977, God had a plan for us. It took us many years to see that plan develop, but here we are. Somewhere around 40 years old, we truly received Jesus, and then the journey really began. And then together, as a family, we have learned to love, live, and trust our Savior, Jesus Christ. Over the years, I have learned that Jesus Christ is my foundation. He is my rock. I need him. And I need to be rooted and grounded in his love. Oh, I left out the part of my daughters. Yes, we have two daughters. <laughs> One's with me this evening, so we have two daughters. I have a one-year-old grandson. He just turned one last week, Wednesday. And I have a soon-to-be grandson. When Liz gets married, we will be taking on board a 17-year-old grandson, step-grandson. So 
always wanted grandchildren, and for some reason, the Lord waited till I was 60 years old to give me any. And now he has given me one that's only a year old, and he has given me one that's 17 years old. So I guess he wants to make sure I enjoy the infant stage and the teenager stage. I, I don't really know, but I'll take it. But life does get crazy, is it not? Is it not crazy? I look back in my BC days before Christ, and how did I ever survive? I, every crisis that came my way, I just crumbled. I toppled. I, I had no inner strength to hold up in any storm. But knowing Jesus Christ as my Savior, and now being rooted and grounded in him, I am strengthened for the trials and the struggles that come, that will continue to come. Now, rather than crumbling in despair, I'm able to turn to Christ. I seek him for my strength, my comfort, and my peace. So let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. If you have your Bible, I'll give you a minute to turn there. This is a very powerful prayer that Paul had for the Ephesian church. And as you read this scripture, and we'll read it in a moment, you can't come away from this believing that we make things happen on our own. Now we have a part to play. We are called to study and meditate on scripture. We are called to spend time in the word. We must purpose to live and breathe in the presence of Jesus Christ. We must commune with him, always building our relationship with him, praising more, worshiping more, trusting more. I find strength in Jesus Christ, my savior. I depend on him and I look to him for guidance. I love to spend time with my Lord. My favorite time of the day is generally in the morning, barred any other interruptions, and when I can sit with my Lord, I can read his word, I can close my ears to the world, I can block my mind from all that's going on in the crazy world we live in, and I fully open my heart and soul to my Lord, hearing, listening, knowing, and experiencing his grace his love, and his strength. However, I cannot do it on my own. Now, I have to take just a little, just a little break here for a little story. <laughs> the word however. I did not realize that in our Bible study that I lead, how often I say the word however. Apparently, I say it a lot. Uh, because there's always like, oh, this could happen. However, we have the grace of Jesus Christ, right? Well, one morning, somebody's friend joined her to our Bible study. I'd never met her before. Her name was Felicia, nice lady. And I didn't see Felicia again until probably a month or so later. And it was sadly at my sister-in-law's calling hours. But Felicia was a friend of hers also, and I didn't know that. So she came in and I was like, oh, hi, Felicia, how are you? and she didn't recognize me. And I said, wait a minute. I said, let me pull my hair up, because I always have my hair up, because I'm lazy to do my hair. So I said, let me pull my hair up. And she looked at me, she says, okay. She says, now say, however. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, however. She goes, oh, okay, yeah, I know it's you. <laughs> so that made me realize, wow, I say that a lot. I don't know, did I raise you girls saying however all the time? Like, well, you can stay out late if you want, however. <laughs> so let's look at our scripture today, Ephesians 3, verses 16 through 19. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width 
and the length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow, three little verses, a whole lot to say. When I was looking through the different commentaries studying this, I, I liked what Warren Wearsby had to say. He pointed out four requests in Paul's prayer, and each request was connected to or built upon the one before it. First, Paul prayed for spiritual strength for the inner man so Christ may dwell there. Well, spiritual strength can lead or should lead to a deeper experience in Christ, to be rooted and grounded in him. A deeper experience enables us to apprehend or to grab a hold of the vastness of God's love. And when we can grab a hold of how vast God's love is for us, we will then be filled with all the fullness of God. So let's break down these verses a little bit. Verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Paul prayed for strength. Where does that strength come from? I loved the music this morning because it so much just reminded us that we can't do this on our own. It's all about Jesus. So he says that he would grant you. Well, the word grant, what is a grant? If you get a grant for your college tuition, you don't pay for it. It's free. It's given to you. Well, that's what he's asking for. We will be granted according to the riches of his glory. He gives it to us. It's free. You don't have to purchase it. You can't purchase it. Jesus Christ has granted us so many things. He's granted us life. He purchased that on the cross. He granted us citizenship in heaven, and it cost him everything. But it is free for you and me. And he will grant you strength. He will grant you strength according to the riches of his glory. It is so important to understand that we didn't receive anything because of our own greatness. Jesus granted me nothing because of how wonderful I am. If it was based on how wonderful I am, I would be living in poverty. <laughs> I purchased nothing from him with my own wealth. My social status did not determine the size of his grant. It has nothing to do with how great I am. It has everything to do with how great he is. He's not stingy or selfish with his glory. Remember, Jesus lived in glory. And Jesus left glory to come down here to live on this earth for one purpose to take the sin of the world upon himself so that all who believe in him will live with him in his glory forever. And that's what he did on the cross. But it wasn't done. He died on the cross. He ascended back into heaven. But he didn't leave us stranded. He sent the power down. He returned to glory and he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell and empower his people down here. It is this power that enables us to live a Christian life. Romans 8, 9 tells us, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Holy Spirit of Christ, he is not his. All this was granted according to the riches of his glory. Then it tells us to be strengthened with might. Jesus is not just sprinkling a little 
a little strength here, a little strength there. No, he's not stingy with his glory, and he's not stingy with his strength. He strengthens us with might, with power. Through the spirit of the inner man. What is the source of the believer's strength? Is it our own physical power? Is it our own career, our own lifetime accomplishments? It's none of the above. The source of our strength is the Holy Spirit in the inner man, in our spiritual being. Christ's dwelling place. Now, we all have strengths, and that's good. We're all granted strengths. We're all granted talents. Sometimes it's our intellect. Sometimes it's our compassion. Maybe it's our conscience. And it's good, but consider this. No matter how smart you may be or how much common sense you may have, I hate to tell you, ladies, but you're not always right. Intellect can fail you. Strength through the Holy Spirit will never fail. In times, I advise you, if you have big decisions to make or small decisions to make, weigh your smarts against the Holy Spirit and then choose the strength of the Holy Spirit. Compassions and emotions will fail you. I am probably the most emotional person to ever walk the face of the earth. It's terrible. I cry at everything. My dear sister-in-law told me that I would cry at a supermarket opening, and I don't think she's far off on that. (laughs) It's always been very easy for me to follow my heart without thinking it through, without praying about it. And following your heart, because it's tugging at your heartstrings, can lead you into a big fat mess. Sometimes it might end up, you end up with lots of dogs, my daughter, uh, maybe more chickens than I really need to have, or, you know. So again, weigh your emotions against the Holy Spirit. Then choose the Holy Spirit strength. A good conscience is a great thing. Who wants to have guilt and shame hanging over her head? But who decides what is good? Conscience is very flexible. Society and culture will easily and even forcibly dictate what is a good conscience, what is acceptable. I can confidently say that the conscience of today's culture is not always acceptable to Jesus Christ. Conscience can be warped, it can be weak, and it can be wrong. How do you know what to choose? How do you know what to do? Go to the Word. What does the Word say about your crisis, about your dilemma, about the challenges laying before you? Weigh your conscience against the Holy Spirit. Then choose the strength of the Holy Spirit. And finally, a strong will. A strong will is considered an attribute to success. And yes, it is. You have to be strong to stand up for yourself. You have to be strong to make your mark in your life, to succeed in business and even to succeed in ministry. But beware, a strong will can easily lead to a controlling spirit which can lead to tyranny. My way or the highway type of an attitude. So stand up for yourself when you're needed. Be strong, but channel that strength in the right direction. Examine your heart. Examine your strength. Is your strength witnessing and example in Christ? So weigh your will against the Holy Spirit and choose what? The strength of the Holy Spirit. Now, our spirit was designed to receive the Holy Spirit. Our entire lives were meant to be an expression of him, to be ruled by him. But sadly, 
Back in the garden, Adam ate that forbidden fruit. And as a result of man's disobedience in the garden, the Holy Spirit left. Sin entered. Man no longer was controlled by the Holy Spirit, but rather by sin. He no longer reflected the image of God. However, do not despair, sisters, in Christ, because the Holy Spirit is still available to all those who believe in him, to all those who call on him. We can still reflect the image of Christ, but we cannot do it alone. We must call on the strength of the Holy Spirit in our inner man. God's plan is for us to be led by the Spirit, to be guided and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he makes all his riches available to us, so accept those riches and live according to them and exhibit them to a lost world. Verse 17. Now I'm going to see if I can open this without spilling it all over the front of me. Probably not. My assistant should be doing this for me. I'll just take it off and just not do it the dainty way. How's that? Thank you. Verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Who or what dwells in your heart, ladies? We all would love to say, oh, Jesus fills my heart. But does he truly fill your heart? How much space is he allowed in there? Does he have to share it with pride, ambition, anger, bitterness, jealousy? Christ in us suggests that he abides, he lives in us. He's not just passing through. He's not just stopping by for morning coffee or afternoon tea and then going on his way. But sadly, sometimes we often view him that way. No. When we accept Jesus, he moves in. He becomes a permanent tenant in our hearts through the Holy Spirit in our inner man. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Well, rooted, rooted kind of really connects to our life quite a bit because my husband, Russ, is an avid gardener. Now, he just doesn't plant a few flowers in a little patio garden. No. He started with an average size garden that would feed our family of four and put some veggies up for the winter. Well, that soon grew into a garden that truly is so big we can feed half the neighborhood. I'm not kidding, ladies. Last year, we harvested 3,000, yes, 1,000 bulbs of garlic. Three, he decided he needed to cut back this year, so he only planted 2,000. <laughs> we eat, sleep, and drink garlic. Let me tell you, it's just crazy. Well, he also a few years back took an interest in grafting apple trees. He's, you know, always looking for the stronger, healthier, beautiful fruit. You know, in our front yard, we have this very old apple tree. And so he grafted several branches. He would pick them up different places, you know, in orchards or wherever. And he granted that, or grafted them into our apple tree. And he was so excited when they, they begin to bear beautiful apples. Well, this one day, his mom stopped up for a visit. visit. And they all, his family always had to come and ooh and ah over his garden. And he's like, Ma, you got to come see the apple tree. So Mom goes out and she looks up in the tree and she says, Russell, there's pears in that tree. (laughs) 
Now, now mom was 93 years old at the time, so he questioned her vision and her senility. But upon closer investigation, sure enough, there was a branch of pears in our apple tree. <laughs> and those pears ripened, and they were very tasty. But that was the end of them. Because you see, they were not grafted into an apple tree. No, reverse that. They were not granted into a pear tree, they were grafted into an apple tree. So although they flourished for a season, they couldn't sustain because they were not grafted into the vine that they were created for. So be careful. We are created for the glory of God. So be careful and make sure that you are grafting yourself to him. When you choose to graft into the world, you may flourish for a time. But without the one true vine, Jesus Christ, you will perish. Have you made room for Christ in your heart? Have you grafted yourself to him? We're going to all graft ourselves or attach ourselves to something. Be wise. Graft yourself to Christ and his word. And be rooted and grounded in love. Now again, roots... Roots can go deep, roots can be shallow. We have a lot of trees around our house. And I've learned over the years that hardwoods, such as oak trees, maple trees, nut trees, they have very deep, strong roots. So when the wind comes through, they might shake a little bit, you might, branches might crack, but they very rarely topple. Softwoods, on the other hand, like pine trees, have shallow roots. Now they have a large root system. It spreads out over a huge area, but it doesn't go very deep. So when a windstorm comes, they tend to fall more easily. Is that your faith? Is your faith widespread but shallow? Because if it is, when the big storms come, you're going to fall. But is your faith deep-rooted? Does Christ firmly dwell in your heart? Is it your life centered on him? Do you spend time in his presence? If so, when the storms come, you may sway, you may crack, you might lose some branches, or if you're a mom, some hair, but you will not topple, you will not fall. Love, rooted and, rounded, rooted and grounded in love. Love, just like plants, needs nurturing. And if love is the soil of our Christian life, what are we doing to strengthen and nourish our soil? If you simply drop a seed in a pile of sand and it gets no sun and you give it no water, chances are it's not going to produce. You need to till the soil enrich it with good nutrients, feed it. This is the time of year when that's just what's going on. Russ is tilling the garden. He is putting in all the compost that we've gathered through the years. We're planting the seeds. And soon we'll spend the summer months weeding, feeding, and watering the garden and watching out for predators. We have to beware of predators. They sneak in at night and they eat those tender plants. Yes, those cute little groundhogs, those little chipmunks that love our blueberries, the beautiful deer that just come in at night and wreak havoc on our crops. You have to watch out for them. So we'll spend countless hours weeding, discerning the weeds from the good plants because sometimes they very much resemble each other. I got to say, I didn't grow up gardening. And when I first started weeding Russ's garden, I was forever digging little holes and putting the good plants back in because I pulled out the wrong one and I didn't want to get caught. I just said, oh, please grow, please grow. But the result of all of our hard work will be fresh veggies and fruits to enjoy in the summer and through the winter. 
but so too we need to nurture our faith and our love. Prepare your heart by spending time in Scripture, by knowing Jesus and what he came to accomplish. Nourish your heart through prayer and fellowship with the Savior and your fellow saints. Protect your heart from predators. <sighs> they might appear beautiful and enticing, but in the end, they will destroy your crops. And discern the weeds. Sort them from the good plants and look closely. Oftentimes, sins are disguised as good deeds and well intentions. Then enjoy the love that Jesus Christ has given you. Let him live in your heart and share the bounty with those around you. Christ indwelled and abiding in our hearts will fill our lives with love. We will be able to love God and love man with a love that's based on Christ, not on our appearance, on our abilities, or on our successes. It will be the love that God intended us to have, and it will ground you. Grounding. Okay, rooting is plants. Grounding is, has more to do with the foundation of a building. Well, as it would have it, my husband not only is an avid gardener, he's also a home inspector by trade. That's his job. And his job, part of that is to inspect foundations. Now, Matthew 7, 25 tells us the wise man built his house upon the rock. We all know that little song. I promise I will not break into it right now. But as a home inspector which, a little side note, the name of his business is House Wise because it came from the wise man builds his house upon the rock. So, uh, but he knows foundations. He inspects them. He lets his clients know of any weaknesses in the foundation, any cracks, any water leaks, because a house can look very beautiful and very perfect, but if the foundation is bad, the whole house is in jeopardy. Sometimes he can look, he can just get out of the car and look at the house and say, oh, their foundation is bad. How do you know that? Well, there's a dip here or there's a dip there or the window's crooked or whatever. He can just tell. So many homes do look beautiful, but the foundation is a mess and it costs the homeowners thousands to repair it. Our own home is a perfect example. <laughs> We've lived in our home for how many? 30 plus years. Yeah, she was only two, four, four. Okay. She was only four when we moved in, and, and what a nice little house it was. It's not big, it's not a castle, but the downstairs was all finished and carpeted and paneled, and, and we just had this nice little house. Well, last year, Russ suspected a little problem, and he started pulling the paneling off of the downstairs walls in our nice little house. And we found that the whole foundation, once it was revealed, totally bowed out hugely with a huge crack about this wide, went the whole length of the front of our house. See, it looked beautiful, but there was a lot hidden under that beauty. The foundation was bad. So he spent months repairing the foundation, and I will not go into that. So as Christians, our endeavors must be grounded in love. The foundation of our life must be love. First and foremost should be our love for God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, our Savior. If our efforts are not grounded in love, they are worthless. The size, the beauty, the wealth of a church is useless if love does not abide within its leadership and its congregation. And I hadn't meant to speak on this, but as I'm walking through this church, you guys have a beautiful church. Our entire church building, the entire everything would fit in this room. We have like the tiniest church in the state. 
But in both churches, I see love. I see so much love among you guys here. Yeah, I've known Martha, and I've, I met the WOW team a little, a little while ago, and just, it's just amazing. But it's not because of the size of your beautiful church. It's because of your love for Christ. We need that foundation of love for Jesus to ground us to withstand the rain, the storms, the wind of life. So when a storm comes upon your life, will you stand? Will you stand on the rock of Jesus Christ and weather the storm? Or will you cower to the voice of the world around you, trusting in their lies and find yourself washed away from his foundation? Have you, Christian, left your first love? Has power, wealth, popularity, vanity taken Jesus' place in your heart? Your love must be your grounding. Forget the size of the building. Forget the fancy technology and the impressive worship band. And you guys were impressive. They're all great. But if all of that was taken away, would you still stand? Jesus says to us in Revelation 2.25, nevertheless, he was speaking again to the Ephesus church, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, I know I may be kind of repetitive here on the foundation of love, but that is just, it's just a point that has to be driven home. Is your heart deeply grounded and rooted, strengthened through his spirit in your inner man? Where is Jesus Christ on your love list? Is he first? Or does he kind of fall below other things that come in our life? Return to your first love. Return to the only one that can fully strengthen, ground you, and root you. Roots planted in the love of the world are shallow. They will dry up. They will wither. Roots deeply grounded in Jesus Christ will not. They may go through some drought, but watering them with the word will always revive them. As I said before, the winds may shake our trees, but if our roots are grounded, we'll stand firm. Sometimes we have to have a little beauty clipping in order to produce better fruits and flowers. Many plants require a cutting back. We prune them down. We cut them down so they can come back stronger and mightier. However, my husband learns you do not do that to a jade plant. And you especially don't do that to your wife's jade plant that has taken her five Years to get big and beautiful? Yeah, he tried it once. It's this big. And everybody that came in said, what happened to your jade plant? Of course, I'm not famous for my plant growing, so everybody was so proud of me to grow that jade plant. That's not going to come back. Oh, don't prune and cut back your jade plant. Anyway, but we do need to prune away the weak limbs and take away the fruit that hinders the growth of our perfect fruit. So look at your life and cut back those weak or diseased limbs. Cut them away from your heart so that you can produce stronger, healthier fruit. Verse 18 may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length, the depth and the height. How can we ever comprehend the expanse of God's love? Well, we really can't. We can see Christ's love, or God's love in Jesus Christ because the love of Christ is the love of God. But how do we explain how vast that is? Let's start with width. How wide is God's love? Picture with me for a moment God's arms wrapped around the world. 
Really? Oh my. Not just your world, but the whole world. I better talk, talk fast. Whoops. John 6, 3, 37 says, Him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. And in 10, 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. That's any man. You see, God's love is for all mankind. The love of God is so vast and powerful that he chose his only son to come to earth to live among the filthy sinners, to die for those same sinners, securing them a place in heaven. His love does not follow our church guidelines, our church customs, or our man-made traditions and rules. His love shows no constraints. He doesn't judge us by our physical size. Our size makes no difference to him. I gotta tell you, he gave me the size of being five foot nothing. And then he gave me a family, a six five husband, a five eight daughter, and a six one daughter. But he loves each one of us the same. God does not love us according to our skin color. Remember, he's the one that made our skin color. He does not judge us or love us by our wealth, by our prestige, or by our worldly value. None of that matters to God. He loves all mankind, even the unbelievers. Look in, uh, in the Bible. Who were some of the people that he loved in the Bible? Well, he loved the adulterous woman, the rich young ruler. He loved his betrayer, Judas. He loved his haters, Caiaphas and Annas. He loved Herod, the man who murdered John the Baptist. He loved Pilate. And today, in today's world, he loves the addicts. He loves the homeless. He loves the poor as well as the rich. He loves the single parent. He loves the troubled teen. He loves you, and he loves me. And what is the length of God's love? How can we possibly measure the length of his love? We cannot measure it with a ruler or with a tape measure. No. The true length of God's love begins at the cross. At the cross. Where the Lamb of God no, I want to reverse that a little bit. The true length of Christ's love begins at the cross where the Lamb of God was slain, where he took the sins of the world upon himself, where his father turned away from him because he was covered in filthy sin, where he suffered shame, pain, and abandonment. That is where the length of Christ's love begins. So where does God's love begin? Well, it doesn't. It just always was. John 1.1 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if we believe that, then we have to believe that his love always was. Again, it's incomprehensible. It cannot be proven scientifically. But can it be proven? Well, I think so. It can be proven to us by creation itself. I mean, look at the beautiful world, world that he created for us. And then he created us, man, himself. He gave us and he gives us everything we need to live and breathe, and not just the basics, but look around, the lakes, the trees, the flowers. Now, that much beauty would not be created for someone that God had disdain for. You don't create those things for people that you don't like. You do that for people that you love, and God loved us. And his proof of his love comes from our very birth. Each one of us was born with our own talents. You have your own purpose. You each have your own unique beauty that God gave you. 
And we can't overlook our rebirth. When our physical birth was not enough for us to receive Christ into our hearts because we were too full with filthy sin, he gives us every opportunity to be born again, to die to our old selves and become new creatures in Christ. Which brings me to the greatest proof of his love for us, our redemption and our salvation. No matter the sin, small or great, no matter how dark our heart is or how lost we may be, his redemption is always at hand. And where does God's love end? It doesn't. It goes all the way through eternity. It never fades or drifts. It doesn't shame or shun. It continues to thrive inside the believers who receive it. It is ever present in those who accept it. It is of immeasurable length. He loves us through our disobedience. He loves us even when we reject his holiness. We pay consequences, but he still loves us. Okay. Um, I'm running out here. I'm running late. I'm so sorry. So verse 19. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How can we measure a love so great that he would give his son to be shamed, persecuted, and crucified for our salvation? How can we measure the love of the son who in obedience to his father accepted this task before him? We cannot. The only way we can know the love of Christ is through Christ. We can't through our own human knowledge. It's way above our understanding. But Jesus Christ offers all the resources that we need to walk through our trials. But, however, we have to be willing to accept it. We have to be willing to let go and stop questioning how or why. We have to be willing to surrender ourselves in prayer for whatever that need may be. Not just simply physical healing for ourselves and others, that's important, but also for spiritual strength for ourselves and others, for wisdom, discernment, for others to apprehend or grab a hold of all that God has to offer, to be able to accept God's love, mercy, and grace. To be filled with the fullness of God, dear sisters, is the result of grasping just how vast God's love is for you. That fullness comes from the Holy Spirit himself. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. When we accept Jesus Christ, we are granted the fullness of God. By faith, lay hold of his grace, his power in your life. We are mere humans, unable to comprehend on our own the vastness of his love. However, the Holy Spirit can and will lead the believer into this vast love. Open the word. Meditate on the word. Spend time in his presence. You will, through the obedience to Christ, experience his vast love. You will know to trust him for he is faithful. You will know to call upon him amidst the storm and to praise him and thank him for his deliverance. Be the tree firmly planted. Be the deep roots that sustain through the rains and the winds. Be rooted and grounded in love so you may be filled with the fullness of God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. And I thank you for these beautiful women that are willing to come out and hear and learn. Father, I pray that every heart here has received you. 
that every heart here spends time in your presence, that they will grow in your vast love, and that they will know the fullness of all you have to offer. Amen. Thank you.